you are the nurse assessing a 19-year-old male who presents to the emergency department with chest pain. He localizes the pain to the left parasternal region, and the pain is reproducible with direct pressure. You take his vital signs and they are all within normal limits. He says that he is a very active student who frequently lifts weights, rows crew, and runs marathons. What is the most likely diagnosis? A. Peripheral vascular disease. B. Diabetes mellitus. C. Acute coronary syndrome. D. Costochondritis. E. Pulmonary embolism. The answer is D. Costochondritis. Costochondritis is an inflammation of the cartilage that bridges the sternum to the ribs. It is a very common cause of acute chest pain in young, healthy, physically active individuals without known cardiovascular disease. In this case, we have a very prototypical case, a young, physically active, especially with physical activity involving the chest like weightlifting and rowing crew, otherwise healthy male with focal, reproducible chest pain in the parasternal area, and normal vital signs on presentation. When you see this history, this is a rather convincing case for costochondritis. There is no information given that would seem to indicate a personal or family history of cardiovascular disease, and thus, costochondritis would be the best answer choice. He can be treated conservatively with NSAIDs for anti-inflammatory and pain control effects, acute coronary syndrome, for example myocardial infarction, is very unlikely in this patient as he is young and healthy, has reproducible focal chest pain, is very physically active, and has stable vital signs. If there was a personal or family history of cardiovascular disease, or any report of recent drug use, particularly cocaine, then this could be higher on the differential. Pulmonary embolism is very unlikely in this patient as there is no leg swelling reported, the chest pain is focal, the patient is healthy and active, and his vital signs are normal. Peripheral vascular disease would not present with chest pain, and would be highly unlikely to be present in an otherwise healthy 19 year old. There is nothing to suggest that this healthy, active 19 year old patient has diabetes mellitus from the information provided. You are a nurse at an orthopedics clinic. You are taking care of a football player who suffered a very painful right knee injury. You are concerned that he may have injured the unhappy triad. Which of the following correctly lists all components of the unhappy triad within the knee? A. PCL, LCL, lateral meniscus. B. PCL, MCL, medial meniscus. C. ACL, MCL, lateral meniscus. D. ACL, LCL, lateral meniscus. E. ACL, MCL, medial meniscus. The answer is E. ACL, MCL, medial meniscus. The unhappy triad is frequently injured in athletes who participate in contact sports, such as football. The injury mechanism often involves a direct, forceful hit to a firmly planted leg. The hit is forceful enough to rupture two ligaments, ACL and MCL, as well as the medial meniscus. The treatment for such an injury involves surgical intervention and a lengthy recovery period, though for patients inclined to partake in the rehabilitation process, they can often return to their desired sports after completion of surgery and rehab. You are a nurse in an emergency department and a patient presents following a bicycle accident in which he fractured his right radius and ulna. The patient complains that he cannot feel his extremity distal to the fracture. The right upper extremity is pale, painful, pulseless, and cool to the touch, and the patient complains of occasional pins and needles within and distal to the injury. You note a great deal of swelling around the fracture site. Which of the following is the most likely diagnosis? A. Limb necrosis. B. Vasculitis. C. Compartment syndrome. D. 
D. Lupus. E. Fat embolism. The answer is C. Compartment syndrome. Compartment syndrome is a surgical emergency in which an injury results in hemorrhage or swelling in an enclosed space that causes dangerously high pressures to build within the enclosed space, resulting in compromised blood flow to the muscles and nerves within and distal to the space. The symptoms include a cool, pale, pulseless extremity that may also experience paresthesis, and that is visibly swollen and tense. In this case, the patient's right arm exhibits all of these characteristics, and this presentation is highly consistent with compartment syndrome, the other choices are incorrect. Vasculitis and lupus are both autoimmune conditions that may result in limb swelling, but would be unlikely causes of this patient's presentation, especially in the setting of a recent local trauma to the affected limb. Fat embolism would not account for the patient's constellation of symptoms. There is no evidence of limb necrosis at this stage of the patient's injury. Should the compartment syndrome not be addressed and vascular flow remain compromised by persistently high pressures, then limb ischemia and consequent necrosis could be a downstream effect. What syndrome presents with pain or stiffness, usually in the neck, shoulders, and hips? which may be caused by an inflammatory condition of blood vessels such as temporal arteritis. A. Myositis. B. Guillain-Barr syndrome. C. Amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, ALS. D. Polymilgia rheumatica. The answer is D. Polymilgia rheumatica. Polymilgia rheumatica is an inflammatory musculoskeletal condition that presents with pain or stiffness, usually in the neck, shoulders, and hips. Amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, ALS, is a genetic disorder of muscle wasting and neuronal death. Symptoms include progressive muscular weakness, leading to paralysis and death. Guillain-Barr syndrome is a rapid onset condition of reversible muscle paralysis and weakness following infection, most commonly Campylobacter jejuni. Myositis is a general term for inflammation of the muscles, and can be due to various causes. Duchenne's muscular dystrophy is caused by dysfunctional production of what protein? A. Dystrophin. B. Actin. C. Dystroglycan. D. Troponin. The answer is A. Dystrophin. Duchenne's muscular dystrophy, DMD, is caused by dysfunctional production of dystrophin, a protein that is part of a complex of proteins that anchor the cytoskeleton of a muscle cell to the extracellular matrix also known as the dystrophin-associated protein complex. Its absence disrupts multiple intracellular signaling pathways, leading to muscle necrosis. Dystroglycan is another protein in this complex, but it is unaffected in DMD. Actin and troponin are also unaffected in DMD. Duchenne's muscular dystrophy has what inheritance type? A. X-linked dominant. B. Autosomal dominant. C. X linked recessive. D. Autosomal recessive. The answer is C. X linked recessive. Duchenne's muscular dystrophy is an X linked recessive disease. Because of this, it is almost exclusively seen in males and rarely presents in females. Girls would have to receive a recessive gene on both the X chromosome from their mother and their father. Historically, boys with a defective gene on their X chromosome rarely lived past their teens, decreasing the likelihood of reproduction. What antibodies are present in 90% of patients presenting with myasthenia gravis? A. 
Antibodies to acetylcholinesterase receptor. B. Antibodies to acetylcholine receptors. C. Anti DSDNA, double stranded DNA, antibodies. D. Anti oro antibodies. The answer is B. Antibodies to acetylcholine receptors. Myasthenia gravis is a condition in which the immune system makes antibodies to acetylcholine receptors, thus blocking receptors and preventing the stimulating effect of acetylcholine at the neuromuscular junction. This results in muscle weakness that progresses during activity and improves with rest. Antioral antibodies are commonly seen in Sjogren's syndrome and systemic lupus erythematosus. SLE, and anti-DSDNA antibodies are highly specific for SLE. What condition is characterized by a deficiency of normal type 1 collagen, resulting in the formation of brittle, fragile bones? A. Marfan syndrome. B. Osteogenesis imperfecta. C. Leg Cavperth's syndrome. D. Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. The answer is B. Osteogenesis imperfecta. Osteogenesis imperfecta is a genetic condition characterized by a deficiency of normal type 1 collagen, resulting in the formation of brittle, fragile bones. Bones fracture easily, often with no obvious trauma. Osteogenesis imperfecta has many subcategories that range in severity, several of which are not compatible with life. Ehlers-Danlos syndrome is a collagen abnormality that primarily affects the skin, joints, and vasculature, causing lax joints and general instability. Marfan syndrome is also a condition of connective tissue abnormality, which largely affects the structure and function of smooth muscle in the cardiovascular system. Leg calf Perth's syndrome is a condition of necrosis in the femoral head, not related to any alterations in collagen formation. The rehab nurse provides care to an immobilized patient. He bears weight down on the patient's leg while the patient attempts to lift that leg. What type of exercise is this? A. Active assistive range of motion. B. Isometric. C. Active range of motion. D. Active resistive range of motion. E. Passive range of motion. The answer is D. Active resistive range of motion. Active resistive range of motion is performed by the client against resistance, manual or mechanical. This exercise builds muscle strength. Isometric exercises are performed by the client without motion, rather, the client contracts and relaxes the muscle without moving the joint. This maintains strength in the muscle while the joint is immobilized. Passive range of motion is performed by the nurse without assistance from the client, which retains circulation and range of motion in the joint. Active range of motion is performed by the client without assistance of the nurse and maintains joint mobility and muscle strength. Active assistive range of motion is performed by the client with help of the nurse to increase motion in the joint. In the emergency department, the nurse evaluates a patient with severe pain in the left calf after falling during a soccer game. Which of the following is the most appropriate action by the nurse? A. X-ray the calf. B. Give morphine. C. Apply heat to the calf. D. Notify the physician. E. Bandage the calf. The answer is A. X-ray the calf. The nurse should begin assessment to determine the cause of the complaint. Obtaining an X-ray for the leg is the best assessment. You need to rule out possible fracture before giving pain medication or bandaging the leg. 
heat is inappropriate for this injury because ice is best for sports injuries such as sprains and breaks. Notifying the physician may be done after all assessments are completed. The nurse evaluates a patient's status post right hip replacement and observes a moderate amount of sarasanganous drainage on the dressing one day after the surgery. Which of the following is the best action? A. Leave the dressing alone to let the wound heal. B. Notify the doctor about possible infection. C. Change the dressing and clean the site with normal saline. D. Replace the dressing and document. E. Remove the dressing and leave the wound open to air. The answer is D. Replace the dressing and document. 24 hours after surgery, surgical wounds are expected to drain small to moderate amounts of serous or sarasanganous drainage. The physician does not need to be notified because this observation is expected and not emergent, however, the doctor would be notified if drainage exceeds these expectations. The soil dressing should be removed and replaced with a new dressing, and the wound site would not be irrigated unless infected, there are no signs of infection noted. The wound should not be open to air due to the risk of infection. The nurse should always document wound appearance and dressing changes. The nurse prepares discharge information for a 70-year-old woman recently diagnosed with osteoporosis. Which of the following information is most essential for the nurse to share with the patient? A. A recommendation for a doctor that specializes in bone pain. B. An information sheet for acetaminophen use. C. A pamphlet about physical activity and daily exercise for people with osteoporosis. D. A flyer for an soccer program. E. A brochure about opiate medication use. The answer is C. A pamphlet about physical activity and daily exercise for people with osteoporosis. Osteoporosis is common among elderly women. Patients require important education on how to live with the disease. Lifestyle changes such as diet and exercise should be promoted by the patient during discharge, and should be specific to the patient's condition. Of the available options, the most accurate and essential information for the nurse to share should concern physical activity and exercise, as osteoporosis affects bone density and body strength. A recommendation for a doctor that specializes in bone pain may be beneficial, but is not a responsibility of the nurse. Education is the priority. Patients with osteoporosis that are being discharged usually take ibuprofen to manage pain, not opioids or acetaminophen. A soccer program may not be appropriate for a 70-year-old woman with osteoporosis, a flyer for an adult walking group might be better. All of the following are common findings in osteoarthritis except dash. A. Stiffness and pain in affected joints. B. Bony protuberances of affected joints. C. Symmetrical joint involvement. D. Asymmetrical joint involvement. The answer is C. Symmetrical joint involvement. Osteoarthritis generally presents as asymmetrical joint stiffness and pain, often with bony protuberances, osteophytes, that are either palpable or visible on imaging. Symmetrical joint involvement is more typical in rheumatoid arthritis. Joints will present with signs of inflammation, redness, heat, pain, and swelling, due to the inflammatory nature of this condition. A positive anterior drawer test of the knee would be indicative of injury to which of the following structures? A. Lateral collateral ligament. B. Posterior cruciate ligament. C. Medial collateral ligament. D. Anterior cruciate ligament.
The answer is D. Anterior cruciate ligament. The anterior drawer test of the knee checks for injury to or instability of the anterior cruciate ligament. During this test the patient lies supine position with knees bent to 90 degrees. The practitioner sits on the both feet of the subject and places both hands around the upper tibia of the patient's symptomatic leg, then pulls anteriorly on the proximal tibia. A positive finding would be excessive anterior translocation or a soft and feel, indicating a sprain or tear of the anterior cruciate ligament. lambert eaton syndrome is associated with what malignancy? A. Gastric carcinoma. B. Colon cancer. C. Small cell lung cancer. D. Melanoma. The answer is C. Small cell lung cancer. Approximately 60% of individuals with Lambert-Eaton syndrome have small cell lung cancer. The onset of Lambert-Eaton symptoms often precedes the detection of the cancer and should be followed up with radiographic imaging of the chest. A postmenopausal female client presents to the client after being newly diagnosed with osteoporosis. The client is here to discuss with the nurse what type of lifestyle modifications she will need to treat the disease. Which of the following should the nurse include when educating the client? A. Start a low-carbohydrate high-protein diet. B. Quit smoking. C. Lose 10 pounds. D. Drink one glass of wine with dinner. E. Engage in low-impact exercises. The answer is B. Quit smoking. Smoking and alcohol ingestion are risk factors for developing osteopenia or osteoporosis. These activities should be discontinued to help prevent against bone loss. Diet and exercise are important factors, but losing 10 pounds or low impact exercise will not increase bone mass. The nurse cares for a 16 year old patient in the emergency department. He has returned to the hospital after having a fiberglass cast applied to his right ulna from a fracture the day before. Which of the following manifestations in the patient should most concern the nurse? A. Warm fingers and palm in the right hand. B. Capillary refill of 3 seconds in the right fingertips. C. Itching under the cast. D. Severe pain in the right arm. E. Pain in the right shoulder. The answer is D. Severe pain in the right arm. The nurse should be aware of potential complications of cast placement, such as compartment syndrome, which can cause nervous, vascular, and muscle damage. Signs and symptoms include tingling distal to the cast placement, severe pain in the casted region, swelling in the cast and distal to the casted region, pallor in the affected region, and muscle weakness. These signs and symptoms would indicate immediate cast removal to prevent further damage to the tissue. Itching under the cast is common and expected, and pain in supporting shoulder of the arm can occur due to the increased weight and positioning of the cast. 3 seconds for capillary refill is within normal limits, extended time for capillary refill in the distal region would be concerning. Warmth in the hand and fingers distal for the casted region would indicate normal circulation as well but congestion and swelling in the extremity would be worrisome. Which of the following is described as a malformation resulting in narrowing or absence of a portion of the intestine? A. Malrotation. B. Intestinal atresia. C. Volvulus. D. Hirschsprung's disease. The answer is B. Intestinal atresia. Intestinal atresia is a malformation resulting in narrowing or absence of a portion of the intestine. 
duodenal atresia is the most common type, followed by ileoatresia. Hirschsprung's disease is an issue of innervation in the large intestine that can result in narrowing due to contraction, but there is no structural malformation in the bowel itself. Malrotation and volvulus are often seen together when a part of the intestine does not anchor or turn correctly during formation, malrotation, and then becomes twisted around itself, volvulus, resulting in constriction and loss of function. What is the triad of symptoms often seen within tuss susception? A. Bloody vomit, black stool, and low back pain. B. Colicky abdominal pain, bilious vomit, and red currant jelly stool. C. Constipation, projectile vomiting, jaundice. D. Coffee ground damasis, bloating, and diarrhea. The answer is B. Colicky abdominal pain, bilious vomit and red currant jelly stool. Intussusception occurs when part of the intestine folds into another section of intestine, much like a telescope. This results in sharp, grumpy, or colicky abdominal pain, vomit of bile, and bloody red currant jelly stool. Black stool and coffee ground emesis are both symptoms of upper gastrointestinal bleeding, stomach, generally, while projectile vomiting may be associated with pyloric stenosis. What is the most common location for diverticulitis? A. Ascending colon. B. Transverse colon. C. Splenic flexure. D. Sigmoid colon. The answer is D. Sigmoid colon. The most common location for diverticulitis is the sigmoid colon. This area generally has increased pressure as compared to the rest of the large intestine and is especially vulnerable to weakness in the muscle layers of the colon wall. What part of the bowel is most often affected by Crohn's disease? A. The terminal ileum. B. The sigmoid colon. C. The ascending colon. D. The rectum. The answer is A. The terminal ileum. While Crohn's disease can affect any part of the alimentary canal, the small intestine, particularly the terminal ileum, is the most common site of sericyl inflammation. What is the characteristic mucosal alteration seen in ulcerative colitis? A. Thickened mucosa. B. Skip lesions. C. Cryptabscess. D. Granulomas. The answer is C. Cryptabscess. The characteristic histological alteration seen in ulcerative colitis is the cryptabscess, in which inflammation causes loss of goblet cells due to neutrophilic exudate in glandular lumens. Granulomas, thickened mucosa, and skip lesions are all seen in Crohn's disease. Frequent projectile, non-bilious vomiting starting 2 to 3 weeks after birth is indicative of what condition? A. Intussusception. B. Infant gastroesophageal reflux disease, GERD. C. Congenital hypertrophic pyloric stenosis. D. Diverticulitis. The answer is C. Congenital hypertrophic pyloric stenosis. In congenital hypertrophic pyloric stenosis, the smooth muscle of the pylorus becomes thickened, decreasing the lumen size of the pylorus. This prevents food from passing out of the stomach and into the small intestine, resulting in vomiting which is often projectile intense to be non-bilious. Intussusception may show vomiting, 
but the more obvious sign is bloody current jelly stools. Infant gastroesophageal reflux disease, GERD, may result in frequent spitting up, but projectile vomiting is rare. Diverticulitis is generally a condition of the elderly and tends to present as abdominal pain with alterations in bowel function and mild fever. What comorbidity is generally seen with esophageal vresis? A. Gastroesophageal reflux disease, GERD. B. Achalasia. C. Hiatal hernia. D. Cirrhosis. The answer is D. Cirrhosis. Esophageal vresis are most commonly seen in patients with cirrhosis due to portal hypertension. Gastroesophageal reflux disease, GERD, is associated with esophagitis and occasionally with metaplastic changes. Neither hiatal hernia nor achalasia are associated with esophageal vresis. What sign might indicate Hirschsprung's disease in a newborn? A. Unrelenting crying. B. Bloody stool 3 to 5 days after birth. C. Vomiting within 48 hours of delivery. D. Failure to pass meconium within 48 hours of delivery. The answer is D. Failure to pass meconium within 48 hours of delivery. While an infant with Hirschsprung's disease may have vomiting and bloody stool, the most common sign is failure to pass meconium within 48 hours of delivery. Hirschsprung's disease, which is an absence of innervation to the large intestine, which results in narrowing and constriction of one part of the bowel and dilation of the preceding segment, can be diagnosed by biopsy of the distally narrowed segment of the bowel.